a little bit boring opening ceremony. I'm kidding. It's not, it's not, that, it's, it's not that you're uh, not in the mood yet, but let's just say your problem happened then. Um, most of you are here today because there are two buzzwords in the title of this presentation. One of them is data analytics. Please raise your hand if you're here for this. Ah, there we go. And there's customer journey. Those who are here for that, okay. So I can see there's a majority who are here for the analytics. Um, let's see, who here can give me a definition of what data analytics are? Please, anyone. Okay, we're off on a good start. Uh, and what about the customer journey? Who here could define, in just a, a simple sentence, what a customer journey is? Yes? Customer experience, what, what, uh, what he or she will uh, have to uh, face to get to the So the path. Basically. Close. That's nice. Lucky you, in this talk, we have definitions. Right. Uh, but before that, I'd like to get a feel of who's in the crowd. Can you please raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur of any kind, if you have your own company? All right, and who here is a marketer, or was a marketer, or is in the field of marketing? All right, what about threats? Can you tell me what you guys do? Those who haven't raised your hands, yeah? We are a mix of everything. We're the team of Amalki.net, so we do editorial, okay. we do marketing, and uh, right. we're in direct contact with our uh, advertisers. Uh -huh. And so you're an online platform for beauty? Yeah, for beauty and fashion. Yeah. Okay. Luxury. Oh, you're in love. Uh, who else? Who else is uh, either an entrepreneur or, uh, or a marketer and has something to, to share about what they do? Yes? Services for more. Like, give me more. Uh, Manage services for more. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, corporate clients? Corporate. Corporate. And? Uh, corporate and government. Okay, great, great, great. So we have a bit of a mix of everything, that's great. Um, you have to uh, keep in mind two things for this workshop. First, you're not needed to be a technical person. We are going to define everything we talk about, and then we're going to, I'm not going to teach you how to do it yourself, but I'm going to teach you to ask the right questions and what to look for, what to watch out for in the user experience and what you measure in that. Before I actually get started with the beefy part, I'd like to tell you a bit about myself. Uh, I started a few years ago in advertising as a copywriter and then I moved on to digital very quickly. Uh, there I was head of content for a while in an online marketing agency and then I moved to uh, entrepreneurship and tech and on the client side. I left the agencies and I worked a lot with startups and people who uh, really need to Who's trying to not spend a lot of on marketing and still get a lot of uh, results? Uh, so I, um, I left uh, the entrepreneurship community uh, on the tech side to uh, work with Edeline, who you will meet across the back. Uh, over there she is. Uh, Edeline is my partner in Bird House, and we're opening the first growth hacking agency in Lebanon. But um, what, you're gonna, what we're going to talk about today is not growth hacking, although it is a part of how we think, how we approach, and how we manage uh, user experiences across the board. Now I'd like to move on to the next slide, and that will happen as soon as I get some. Uh, Great. Okay, today the, the workshop is divided into three main parts. First one is defining user journey. You can't really optimize or make better something that you can't quantify. Then we're going to explore the best ways to interact which means that we're not going to assume that we're right. We're just going to start from scratch and say, hey, what can I do? Now that I have this journey, how can I go at it? Uh, go at it? And then we're going to measure meaningful interactions because if you can quantify something and you can uh, explore it, you won't know if you're going the right way if you can't measure it. We're going to start with this, and I'm being very little literal here. I <coughs> apologize, but in defining the user's uh, journey, we're going to start by actually defining what it is. Sorry. Uh, ah, yes. Before we actually uh, start, uh, continue, uh, Edina is going to give you a little tablet where I'm actually uh, uh, asking for some information about you. Um, please fill it out if you will. If you don't want to, please pass it on to the next person next to you. So the customer journey is the sum of all interactions that your uh, customers are going to have with you, with your company, with your brand, with your salespeople, with your websites, your apps. Uh, your stores, your product in the stores, um, anything, anything at all that, in, that is an interaction with your brand is part of the user journey. Now, um, a while ago, we used to look at it that way. Ooh, sorry. We used to look at it that way. There was awareness, 
someone sees an ad, they say, hey, that's a, that's a new place that does something. Great, now I know that they exist. Then there was leads. Leads were considered people who were ready or willing to buy. Uh, buy what? Uh, depending on what you do. And finally, we have prospects, people who have actually manifested their interest and who have expressed their will, their will to buy and have even sometimes have given up information such as their addresses, phone numbers, and so on and so forth. But this is today not as true as it was because we have gone to the hourglass. The hourglass is a much more comprehensive model that uh, takes in and embraces uh, the digital model because it starts with engagement and education. You cannot just show today your product, you also have to engage. If, if someone doesn't follow your, your page on social media, they're 50% less likely to actually buy from you in real life. So education is part of it. Then there's research and evaluation. Now that I've heard of you, I want to know more about you. I want to make sure that I can trust you. If you're an online store, what do, do your customers say? How can I trust that I can buy online from you? I research. And then there's justification and purchase. And I want to stop a little bit on justification specifically. Anything you buy, from the clothes you're wearing, to the bags you're carrying, to the software that you use for your work, at some point, someone said enough to convince you that it is a justified purchase. The word justification is very important because it is internal. It's an internal process that works in two ways. One is inherent to you, uh, how you were brought up, your values, uh, what you had as a child, uh, as clothes, or what you saw your, the people around you wear. Uh, and that's going to create a model of you. Do you, does that model of you identify to what this person is selling me? If I'm buying an iPhone, does the iPhone represent what I stand for and does it have the features that I'm looking for? And that's the second part of justification is, what am I looking for? How many of you come out of a mall and say, hey, I just bought this stuff or these jeans, they were cheap. It's fine, it's got a bonus, I could afford it. You're justifying your purchase, whether it's rational or not. And even when it's rational, even more, because you supposedly have a reason, a valid reason for it. But once you're done purchasing, if you bought, I don't know, Massimo Dutti clothes at a store, Massimo wants you to come back. Again, and again, and again, and again. Until the day where you're all dressed in their clothes and you're telling your friends, oh, I love this brand, they're great, they're amazing, they're fabric, <coughs> nice, whatever, I'm not a salesperson for them, I just make an example. But at some point, you will become an advocate and brands need to take that into consideration. It is not just about selling, it's about retention and it's about advocacy. But how do I do that? Well, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a practical example of what this whole experience looks like. Taking in a very uh, generic example, I came up with this super high-rise logo that you can see here. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about business objectives. Your customer journey starts with who you are. Super shop is a supermarket before anything. Real life or not, they are a supermarket. So when they have a supermarket and delivery on their website, they're still a supermarket, but they have an extra service. And that's a service that they want to develop. Their targets are household and students, as well as expat in the greater Beirut area, because you have to start somewhere. And logistically, it's not very easy to expand over them. This year, they said, we're going to focus on our app. We need awareness. We need people to know about the app. We need downloads. And then we need sales. A funnel, for, sorry, an hourglass for, for this kind of shop would look like this. <coughs> Engagement and education, I need to learn about the brand. You need to know, you need to know, and just to be aware of the fact that there's someone who sells fresh produce, and uh, quality, quality uh, household items in your area, and you can uh, order from them with an app. That's very simple, right? Then, uh, research and evaluation. I need to know how it works, I need to know if there's client reviews, I need to know if uh, I can, um, what's my, what's the process? Download, select, pay. That's great, I, need, I know the process now, I need to be convinced that this is so practical for me, this is so essential for me to have super shop app that I need to get it. Justification, this is very important here. Why am I getting the super shop app? Is it because I can be in traffic, the hour and a half I spend in traffic from downtown to Rabia every day, uh, ordering my groceries and they're here when I go home? Is that is that the justification? Is that the reason why I'm gonna go there and pay maybe the premium on the sale? 
I don't know yet, but it's up to uh, SuperShop to tell me the result is purchase. Download and purchase online. If the result of my campaign is not a business objective KPI going up, such as awareness, download, or sale, then the marketing that I'm doing does not have a purpose. And if the marketing I'm doing does not have a purpose, then why am I doing it? Why am I putting money into it? There's no marketing that is free, that doesn't exist. Your time, the hours you spend, your employees, if they're doing something, you're paying them. I hope. Uh, it's not free. You have to, it's not just a media budget. You can do free operations and still be paying for your, for your uh, marketing. So take that into consideration. Adoption and retention. In this case, I'm changing a habit. What I want is the user to stop going to the grocery store. It's a habit. This person every, every uh, other day goes to the grocery shop to buy some things, and then once a week they go to the supermarket to buy a bunch of things. I am literally asking them to, wait, stop what you usually do. Stop what you've been doing for 20, 25 years, and start doing my thing. And that's very difficult. That's very hard because it also means that I have to optimize the platform they're using. I have to continuously work on every screen that they're experiencing in the, in the, in the, the, the checking process and every process that they go to. I need to measure them and make them better. Until the day they, while having dinner with their friend, the mice, uh, cheese and wine in the, uh, next to the fireplace in January, and they're like, hey, you know, I've been, you know, their friends are saying that they've been having trouble. With, uh, with the grocery because you know they have just had a second kid and it's really difficult for them. And then the friend just says, hey, have you tried Super Shop? I'm just doing that on my way back from work. And there you have it, folks. It's, it, sounds, it sounds simple when you say this like laid out like this and, and, uh, and the result seems minimal. But don't forget that the referral is the <coughs> most efficient way for you to expand. Having friends, telling other friends that their life is better because of a product, an app, a service and whatnot, is your best sales tool. Now I've said, okay, this is what my users go through from hearing about my brand all the way down to um, how they're going to purchase and re-talk about it. Now I need to explore new ways. But before that, we are going to take, I'm sorry, I need to check the time. We are going to take 15 minutes. Groups of four, please. You each have Pens and papers. Actually, three because it seems to be more of a yeah. Groups of three, of three, please. Each one of you works for a company, whatever it is. I'd like you. The person in the middle is the entrepreneur, right? You're gonna pick their service, or you're gonna pick their uh, product, whatever it is. I need one business objective to be attained this year for each entrepreneur. And what kind of marketing um, objective could it translate to? I'm gonna just re-say something a little bit. Um, the marketing objectives was for for the for the, uh, super uh, sorry, for the shop this year was to focus on the app, and the marketing objectives that were here were awareness, app downloads, app sales. If we complete awareness and we get people to download and we get people to to buy through the app, we have reached our business objectives, which is to focus. Maybe the focusing is not the right word, but really focus on developing the sales through the app. I would like you to give me something close to that, and it doesn't have to be very developed and KPI and whatnot. Just give me one business objective and three marketing objectives that result in the success of this business objective. It is now 10 past 10 or 15 past 10, depending on if you're an hour ahead of my time. Okay, we're gonna have 15 minutes to do that, and then I'm gonna ask a few of you, and we're gonna continue the presentation. Thank you. Uh, if you're not completely done, this is fine. I will not grade you. 
I will judge you very much, but I will not bring you back. Uh, so we're going to take three people on stage. We're going to discuss very briefly what, what brought the conclusion that they have these three objectives to reach that business KPI. And we're going to discuss that, discuss that uh, to see if there were any questions, any difficulties going through, and then we can move on to the second part. Uh, I would like to invite this lovely in the second row who uh, had a question, and I'd like them to please join me on stage so we can talk about it with everybody. Please. Right. Whoever, whoever, yeah, all three of you. Come on, come on, say <laughs> Come on, come on, don't be shy. I can, you can tell me what to say and I'll speak out loud. <laughs> so, um, first, I'd like to quickly ask you in one sentence your business, what is your this year's marketing objective, and what you came up with, and where you had uh, issues or questions. Okay, so our business is a um, hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, we are focusing on attracting more clients. Okay. So uh, we will do some statistics. Uh, we will try to advertise a new image for the hospital, tell people how we changed, and uh, get clients' feedback. Some human interaction might uh, make them feel that uh, they're uh, appreciated. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. And you had, sorry, you had a question? I'm going to answer that very simply. Yes, you are. Um, if I may, so the, you have, you have, your, can you tell me again your objective? It's to bring in more new clients. So you need, obviously, you said uh, statistics. I like that they said statistics. <laughs> they reread the title, I think. Um, so advertising a new image. Uh, I'd like to uh, explain something about advertising a new image. It's very difficult to change the people's perception of something when they already have it. <laughs> perception is something that is deeply rooted within you. And if you want to change it, then um, the work that needs to be done is very large, very, very large. So um, this part of your plan requires a lot of operations on the ground, a lot of uh, awareness, <laughs> a lot of video content, and so on. And I think that's a great objective because it will allow them to explore many ways to interact. And although it's a bit difficult because you can't really um, observe conversions per se or app downloads, it's a long-term marketing effort that will uh, bear results over a year, two, three years, and it's very interesting to uh, to look into. And sorry, your third objective? Get client. Okay. Um, get client feedback and statistics are actually kind of the same. So I, th I said they were on the right track. Um, where I think they could do better is they could merge these two and they could actually generate client feedback from both their patients and their uh, online channels, treat all that information as statistics, and then create site services and uh, improve their practices. Uh, so for me, so the statistics and the uh, getting the user feedback is one, although you have to do it in many different ways, and then the, the operation that will come from that will be your uh, exploration part. Thank you. Uh, is there any other group that would like to spend a Three minutes on stage for me to discuss their uh, their objectives. Please. Oh, and thank you. <laughs> Please tell us about your business and your objectives. Hello, everybody. So, uh, my, our start, my startup is a diabetes management mobile application that requires the minimal effort possible from a diabetic to manage his diabetes. Um, so our business objective is uh, basically we have a mobile app and we need 100 users by the end of next month uh, with feedback. To do that, to do that, um, we're building a community of diabetics here in Lebanon. We're partnering. Um, then uh, this is our first marketing goal. Then we need the mobile application. So we're going to offer the application to the community that we build. Uh, and uh, there are certain features that require them to purchase, that require purchasing on the app, and we are looking forward to show value to these uh, features in the mobile application. So the community building you said is the first marketing objective? Yes. What's the second? Uh, mobile app downloads. Downloads and the fee they're incurred? Buying the premium features. Buying, okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, first of all, a uh, hand of applause for those working for the diabetics. Uh, there's a, a lot of initiatives happening right now in Lebanon and they're uh, very important. So if, if uh, education in this field 
is extremely important. Um, our guest mentioned community building. And I want to, again, just like I explained a little earlier, I want to talk about this one. Every single product has a community of some kind. Everyone, even the supermarket. There is a community. There is a sports app. There's food apps. There's vegan food apps. What else can you tell me? There's everything that exists has a community built around it. Music, movies, everything. Even in music, have you heard of the theremin? It's an instrument that's purely magnetic that you play by moving your hands like that. Right? It's, it's super weird. It, it, even this, you have people doing concerts of hundreds of theremins together. Who would have thought? You look at this, you say, hey, what, what is that bar for? What I mean here is, no matter how far you look, you will have a community of these people, and these people are already ready, willing sorry, to buy or interact or learn about you. <coughs> Find them, engage them, and understand them, because these will be your first movers, these will be your first clients, and they will most likely be very, very interested in putting money. If you are part of a specific training community, let's, let's say CrossFit, People who train CrossFit, they buy the CrossFit shoes, they buy the, out the outfits, they have their own barbells, they have specific equipment, they have certification for the gyms, they have certifications for the trainers. Everyone who is into this sport is willing to put money on the table. Mafia had a damn CrossFit who's like, eh, I'll just do it with my tennis shoes. You know what I mean? Uh, so these specific communities are, are important. Um, they're also important because when you have a message specifically like this one that is social before being uh, commercial, the commercial is fine. You can spread it to a million people, eventually you'll have a 10%, 15%, 1% that will buy, that's fine, you can measure it. When it's a message that you're putting out there, when it's the purpose that you're communicating, it's much more difficult. It's much less quantifiable, but it's also uh, a work that can only be done on the long run. So kudos on thinking of that since the beginning. Uh, I think that would be one of the key success factors in your endeavor. Um, we're going to move to exploration a little bit. Sorry, keeping track of time. Uh, we're going to move to exploration because this is um, where things get a little less linear and straightforward. So I'd like to spend some more time on that. Once again, a little definition. Here we have two. Um, to travel over new territory for adventure or discovery. Please raise your hands. I know I'm going to tire you. Raise your hands. Who likes to travel? Who likes to travel to a place they've never been to before? Great. We're on a good ride then. <laughs> to become familiar with by testing or experiencing. How do how many of you have uh, said or heard before? I have the experience. Please. How many of you say this when they go to a job interview or they meet someone? I have the experience. Because the word experience doesn't mean just uh, I've lived through the same thing over and over again. It can also mean I've lived through a thousand things once. But I've lived through. And th this here is key because when you're exploring, you're getting your users to live through a set of interactions and experiences. When they go on your, on your Facebook page for the first time, when they see a commercial on TV for the first time, or a billboard, how does it look? And if they're gonna see the billboard online, and they're gonna go online, uh, sorry, the billboard offline, and they're gonna go online, do they see something they recognize as your brand? You have a, a beauty platform. Branding is super important for you. Consistency in branding is super important for you. But still, there's not one way to do it. There are thousands because there are thousands of people, or millions of potential users, and they are all going to act differently. <coughs> so you need, you never know if you don't try. So the idea here is we're going to try and try and try and try and try, but not without measuring because other than that, it's all going to waste. <sighs> Thanks to explore. Thanks to Explore, uh, the audiences are, I think, one of the most important ones. Your audience is your audiences. Some of you have, think they have, three audiences. You say, hey, we sell to businesses, uh, rich people, and students, cars. We have an offering for the businesses, full fleets, and so on. Rich people, we have a top line of the car, and students, we have a starting offering at 25K. Great. But that doesn't mean a thing. 
that's the marketing department coming to tell you, we've got three new models to sell this year and we have 10,000 of each to sell. What do you sell based on? Can anyone give me an idea of how they pick their audiences? Anyone? Yes, please. Uh, are we talking online? Like any. Any. You, you, because sometimes it's online, sometimes it's offline. Are you talking Facebook ads and stuff? No, 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 no. Your audience. Who receives? Sorry. Me. What the fuck? And don't even go that far. People okay. who would be possibly interested in hearing your message. How do you segment them? How do you give the arboon? If you have lots of cards, how do you? I hear you're location based. Give me another one. Age. 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 Give me another one. Gender. Oh, that's going to be a bit tough. If you're in the US right now, it's touch. Education. Education. As well. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Lifestyle. Income. Nationality. Yes, interest and income. Um, all, all of the metrics so far that, we, that we're getting are um, top line metrics. They're metrics you can get from Facebook audiences. They're metrics you can know from your own research. They're metrics you can know from having a salespeople on the ground who can, I'd say, um, bring that feedback up to you. Now, I want to know something else. Have you ever done a content marketing plan with teams? and evaluated what each person is reading and creating an audience based on that theme. Here's what I'm talking about. If you have content that is only for kids, and content that's only for adults, and content that's only for schools, and content that's only for hospitals, and then you can track every person on their own, what they're reading, and serving them content just based on that, that's a different way to go at it. It doesn't matter if it's the principal of the school or the lowly teacher or the lowest, I would say, uh, part of the, of, the, of the scale, although I think they're very important, the, the janitors. And, and what, if, what if you could train a janitor to save a kid having a, a, sorry, a spike of insulin, I think? That, or, yeah. So what if, what if you needed in the school the janitor to have uh, educational content so that they would intervene in, in the case of uh, at least the first aid, right? What I'm saying is your audience can be based on a behavior. They can be based on content they've seen. They can be based on the number of pages per session, for instance, if you have a website um, they've seen. Or the time they spend reading your content. Maybe some people are more into video and some people are more into uh, blogs. And you can, you can actually measure that and serve them the format they prefer. So that's what I'm talking about. When you test audiences, you can say, yeah, I'm going to target 18 to 24 in Beirut. Uh, and you can say I'm going to target 18 to 24 in Beirut that have already bought more than 50 with more than 50 dollars on my app, and you hit them with an offer that is just for the people who already have spent more than that. This is a different way to look at it, and this makes your audiences unlimited. It just really matters what how far you can go into understanding your users and understanding what matters to them. And I'll give you more clear examples. So I know it's very marketing. -heavy. This I'll get into an example in a minute. Content. This is something that interests everyone. Everyone. You know that you're being filmed, right? And you know that there's a slide here on your on your uh, on the screen. And you know that we're growth hackers. We're filming. We're putting this presentation by email to all of those who put their information uh, in our cockpit. And then it's going to be available to download tomorrow on a special page for our. Uh, and then we're going to use the videos for marketing for ourselves. And then I'm going to measure. I'm going to see. How many of you opened my email? How many of you downloaded the presentation? It's creepy. It's big Brother. Sorry, every time I say this, it's Big Brother. But no, I want to know if you prefer an ebook or a video. Because the next time, instead of serving you a video that you're going to watch 10 seconds of and close, or an ebook that you're going to read two pages of and drop out, I will serve the right content to you. And uh, please take me up on my word. Channels. That's another one. I'm reaching some of you by email. And others, we're going to distribute. I don't have them there in my back. We have little strips of paper with the actual URL of our website for our net for the slides. And that's one channel. And then we're going to do social media ads. That's another channel. And then we're going to give another conference. And that'll be another channel. And we're putting out some uh, articles out there. And that's yet another channel. And then we're going to measure all of that. And then we're going to say, hey, look, conferences are a really, really good way to meet new people, to spread the word out, because one of our KPIs 
this year is awareness and educa education about the growth mindset. So are conferences reaching the right audiences for us with the right message? Because I wouldn't be talking about this at a major, you know, for instance, uh, the banking only uh, uh, event. I'd be talking about something that relates directly to the banking industry. But here we're at Founder Day, we're with people who do their own companies and who start from the ground up or try to get companies to new heights. So we talked about that. So channels. How am I acquiring my users? Are my Facebook uh, users buying more than my uh, Instagram followers? That's a good question to ask. I say that if my Facebook channel is doing very well, I put more money into it. If my Twitter is failing, I try a couple of things. Not really not working, it's on my platform, I can drop it out. Okay? This is very important because it, it really helps you drop out of things you don't need. You don't need a Facebook page. Right now, if you tell me I need an Instagram page, I think, yep, probably there's an 80% chance you need a, uh, an Instagram page. But a Facebook page, if you don't have the budget for it, don't even think about it. They stopped organic reach. So if you're not paying, you're not reaching anyone. Uh, then again, you're putting money into your marketing, what are you getting for it? What are you getting for the $500 you're putting in boosting every month on a social post? I'm not saying you don't get anything. I'm saying, do you know what it is? And have you asked yourself, is it the right thing for me to have? And finally, metrics. Metrics. If we're talking awareness, I want to have video views, I want to have uh, social media following, I want to have engagement on my posts, I want to have people who subscribe to my newsletters, fast, fast, fast. If I want to convert people to download my ebook, or to, I don't know, to buy my X product, or to subscribe to my newsletter, then I'm going to do marketing operations that go specifically for that, and then I'm going to think, how do I measure it? And not just measure the end, not just measure how many subscribers I got, but also measuring where are they dropping out, where am I losing them? Oh, I see you nodding. I think you know what I'm talking about. So when you, people go to your website and they see one, two pages, why aren't they seeing three and four? I'd love to know that, but I need the proper metrics to be in place. And that's, I'd say, the hard part because you don't need you personally to track everything. You have someone who does it for you. But in the end, if this person gives you the wrong metrics and you have no idea, then you gotta stay in the dark. We're gonna talk about this here. A-B testing, because it is at the uh, center of exploration in the, in the growth uh, mindset, and because it's what's going to give us all the data. A-B testing is a process. Please understand this. This is a process at, before anything else. Of running controlled experiments. Second keyword here. Controlled experiments. I know what I'm serving my clients. I know what's different between version A and version B, and I know what I'm measuring exactly to validate hypotheses and, va and provide benchmarks. Hmm? We'll get there. <coughs> I want to run a Facebook campaign, and I want 100 leads out of it. How do I know what my cost per lead should be? Or how do I know that out of the hundreds of audience that exist, I chose the right one? I'm going to A-B test all of it. Every part of the process, I'm going to A-B test and I'm going to measure. Here we go. Audiences. Oh, we're back. Hey. Um, at the justification purchase part, if you remember, if we go back to the example, there was awareness and there was research. And now I'm at this stage where I'm saying, I like this shop, this online grocery thing. Mm, do I give it a try? Yeah, you give it a try. I love it. Audiences. In this case, it's the people who are already within my following, or I already have within my CRM, or I already have within my email newsletter. Right? So these people have heard about I know for a fact they've heard about me and that they're at least interested in my content. That's right. The ad and post. What can you test in an ad post? So these people are going to serve them ads, right? Do I serve them carousel ads, video ads, lead ads, website click ads, website conversion, leads? But there are thousands of ways to do it. And they're, and they're just talking about Facebook to stay consistent here. We're not talking SEM, we're not talking affiliate marketing and so on, and influencer marketing, and whatnot. So, just on Facebook, you already have so many options. How do I choose? Well, I'm going to be a kid, and I'm going to say, I don't choose. <laughs> I'm just going to do all of it. I'm going to put five bucks on 20 campaigns, uh, for a week on 20 campaigns. Five bucks each. I'm going to add segmentation here. So I'm going to say, these are the people who are on my app, who are over a certain age and are, and are willing to spend. So they've come to the checkout, but they haven't completed the purchase, for instance. 
I'm going to put two of these audiences. I'm going to try and fit male and female in the hal. And then I'm going to put ad and post. I'm going to put two different pictures. These two different pictures, or two different pieces of copy, or two different calls to actions, or different formats. I'm going to try all of that. I'm going to try to serve different headlines with different images, with different calls to actions to different audiences. And then I'm going to bring them, depending on who they are, on the relevant page or website. Wait, does that mean I have to make 20 websites? Don't worry, you make one and you create small variations of it that deliver just a different headline or a different call to action with it, depending on the audience. And then finally, of course, form download purchase, whether they're filling out a form, whether they're purchasing something, whether they are uh, downloading an item for it from me, I want to measure always how many downloads. I can use heat maps to look at where they're pointing and where they're not <coughs> pointing and they're missing some fields that people don't want to give out information. Ooh, sorry. And all of that generates data. Traffic, traffic sources, time on page, bounce rate. These are just the top of line metrics. Uh, uh, demographic data, location data, uh, uh, behavioral, downloads, prices. So maybe I'm changing with, the, with my yield management. All of that information, it's huge. And, and I know that we all love that big buzzword, that big data. Ooh, what is all that big hairy monster? The question is not what is it? It's just ones and zeros, it's information. It's treated in a way that ends up looking like charts. Now what? That's a big question, isn't it? Insights. Hmm? No, 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 practice before the insights. We are going to go back to the paper, and this time we're also going to have 15 minutes to put one or two metrics per objectives. Before that, let me give you an example. Let me give you a little example because I want you to really get that right. It's not easy. In audiences, sorry, I'm not going to put metrics there. I want you to tell me I want to test two audiences for my product. Sorry, you have the lifestyle blog. You want to test, I'm just giving an example. Uh, you want to test, you want to see if your campaign works best on UAE fashionistas or Qatar fashionistas. Maybe not a good idea right now. No. Uh, UAE, KSA. KSA. You want to compare your two audiences, right? So, what are you going to compare them based on? What is your segmentation? Say, audience A is these people, audience B is these people. For for services industry, it can be B two B banking, B two B insurance, for instance. That could be one of the ways to look at your two audiences. Add post. You can tell me I'm going to try two different images, or I'm going to try a lead ad post, and I'm going to try redirecting people to the landing page. And here I'm going to try. To have a different page on a uh, different button and different header copy on my landing page, just to test out which one works best. And here I'm going to put two different buttons and calls to action, or two different placements of the form on the landing page. Okay. I want you to imagine how you can apply this model because I don't want you to rethink a whole new model for you. It's going to take too much time. How can you apply this model? Sorry. And what can you test at each part of the process that would make it relevant to you? And please, I'm guessing there will be more questions than on the first one, so I'm going to go through all of you. But uh, please take the same teams again and tell me what can you test or what would you test at each point of the process? Okay? Yeah, I'm going to pass by. Your results and your questions. Uh, 
Um, I know this one was a little harder than the one before. It's a bit more complicated. So first of all, before I we actually take examples, who here had questions? Big, like, like questions that stopped them from moving forward? No one? Wow. So yeah, doing a job here. Ah, thank you. Uh, I believe I have great students. <laughs> So please, uh, can anyone come up here tell me about their um, their experiences and what they like to try with their with their audiences? And please, never be afraid to be wrong. You're not. We're not here to be a right. We're here to explore things. Yeah. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we're a mobile application and a hardware device for matching diabetes. Um, today, uh, clearly our, our audience are diabetics, but that's not only it. It's the diabetics' guardians as well, their parents and loved ones, and it's their doctors. Cool? Uh, so the, we all know that there are two types of diabetics, type 1 and type 2. Mostly type 2 are elderly. Uh, type 1 are, are younger in age. Um, so we got target type 1 diabetics with, uh, with Facebook ads. Okay. But it's not, uh, not all our marketing efforts will be online. Because uh, today, most of our guardians, when it comes to health topics, they rely on morning shows and uh, interviews with doctors and so on. Um, so we're going to try to optimize this channel for guardians, for this, for this audience. When it comes to doctors, uh, today, the only way to reach doctors is through salespeople. So we're gonna have to go step into the doctor's clinics and, and offer them to, to use Spike as a monitoring tool for their patients. Um, when it comes to ads and posts, we decided that the diabetes, today the, booming, the boom trend in, in, for ads is video and GIFs. So we're gonna be A-B testing these two, these two types of ads and we're going to be testing buttons on the ad. Learn more or download or, or sign up to, to, the, uh, to the Spike app. Um, Sorry, uh, perfect example. Please, uh, you said something very interesting here. You said, no, no, uh, do you hear me at all? Yes. Yeah. Anybody not hearing me? OK. He said something very interesting. The two most popular formats are GIF and video. Yes. First of all, so first of all, you, he managed to pull up insi industry insights. He doesn't have historical data, but he has insight. So he starts with an insight that these two are the bigger. But then he says, "Hey, he might not be for my audience. I'm going to test them out." This is exactly what we're talking about. Okay, it's a very small example, and it may sound simple, but think about how it relates to your current process, and really think: Are you doing that? And I bet that for most of you, the answer is no. Not because you're not doing your job right, but because the mindset that has been uh, processed and the mindset that has late marketing are not results driven. While this is it's general insight, transforming it into brand specific insight, and then you can activate and go further within the campaign. But that's exactly what it is. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, we are building a community of diabetics, but we also want mobile application. We are not sure which one should be featured on the first fold of our website. So this is a top uh, something that we're gonna A/B test, or uh, we're gonna test if there should be should be one image or it should be a slider of images uh, to register from. Um, would it work on the download on the, on the because we're a mobile application and when they click they're gonna go to the Android or iOS store. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Questions. I have one. Before I take a question from the public, I have one for you. What exactly are you measuring to notice? The mobile application? The Give me any part of your funnel, or two. Give me two examples. Any two things you said you were going to test, and what you measure, what's your KPI to know if it's successful or not? Um, okay, so. Uh, okay, so the ad, I'm going to know if it's a successful ad. Well, there's. I'm trying to be very For instance, you're testing an acquisition channel, and, or, or the video format. If you're testing GIF versus video, how do you know which one works best? Well, first, well, first of all, I'm going to research benchmarks online. Okay, and what, what's the metric you're going to look at? Oh, no. The clicks. Well, it depends on how on, on how I set the how I set the rule on Facebook. 
No? It depends on the status of that. Is it yeah. engagement or someone else? Or? Sorry, someone else said something uh, before. What were you saying? Views. Views. Which one is it? Is it clicks? Is it views? Is it views? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so basically, yeah, uh, views are kind of like deceivable sometimes because someone just can just open the uh, the YouTube uh, video and just like go and just for really one second. So basically, I don't know if they've changed Instagram, but it should be like at least uh, viewed for 10 seconds or one minute according to the size of the video. So that can be a measurable way. Uh, if it's a blog, we can see if how many uh, uh, how many pages they open, if they subscribe to the newsletter, etc., etc., etc. Um, and also today I can optimize my ad to have it reach a higher number of people who are who are unlikely to to click, which is basically the awareness option in, on Facebook. Or I can have it target people that, that is more segmented that are higher likely to click than only view. And that's a conversion uh, objective on Facebook. So there are multiple ob objectives um, for different types of ads uh, for uh, that are all worth testing. But I'd just like to point out something. It's very interesting that he says that there are very types of ads. Before you choose your type of ad, if you haven't asked the question, what, I, what do I want from this audience, you won't know which one you're going to choose. So the question is not here uh, just which ad they're going to choose or which format, it's also the, why. The measurement, the measurement is they're going to view, they're going to see, they're going to click. But in the end, it's a ratio. What I want to get to is the ratio is how many people see it, saw it, and how many, out of these people, how many click it. But it's a ratio before being a, 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 sorry, yes? Uh, George, there's something like after, and after, there, there's something that comes after the actual insight to get on Facebook. So for instance, if you're redirecting these people to your website, on Google Analytics, would be interesting to kind of uh, track the URL builder of that specific ad and kind of see on the website what was the bounce rate. That is absolutely, absolutely necessary, and this is the third part: is how we measure it and how to like, track everything. What is buffer? But <laughs> but buffer is your tagging to you. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you very much for this example. Thank I you. would like to uh, again a round of applause because he's been very active and did a great job. So, um, interestingly, he, he discussed a lot of things. He talked about ads, he talked about leads, he talked about community building and everything. Um, in the end, his example might not be relevant to you as a brand, as a company, and so on. But you need to find, you need to get to what, where, what is specific to your, to your brand. Once you're there, once you have all these numbers and you've, you've done all of the campaigns and you've tracked all of the, collect the, the, sorry, the leads collected and the funnels and the dropout page and the have done all that. Now what? Now you look into that. Now you actually ask the, the data what you want to know. And that was not expected. <laughs> there we go. Right. Again, I'm going to bore you with this. We still have 20 minutes together. 20 minutes, I'm going to bore you with the process. The process, the process, the process. Of examining data sets to draw conclusions. But you don't examine a thing without asking questions. Did you get any tests at school that had just a blank page? I don't think so. The thing about data analytics is that we hear a lot about it. It's real time. Once it's set up, you'll know who's on your website now. Not who was there yesterday. You get, the first thing you see when you open Google Analytics is on your website now, how many people? Right? It's a live thing. That's what we want to do. It's customizable. There are no two setups that are alike, if you want them to. Let me explain. If you have a website that has the, the main feature is a blog, Set up Google Analytics tracking, you can look at time on pages, some reports. Pretty easy, you know, pretty straightforward. If you have an app, a bidding app, for instance, it's pretty complex. There's a lot of interactions, a lot of screens, a lot of possibilities. And most of it is, is uh, programmatic. You don't even have human interaction um, to, to, to uh, regulate what's happening in the app. So it's customizable. I can measure anything I want on any platform in any possible way, but I need 
the technician to do that most of the times. Again, some tracking is very straightforward, but the behavior-based tracking is pretty difficult. All right? It's pretty difficult because I need to put code in specific places and then set up software that can track all of that, and I need to be able to create reports that show relevant metrics. And the word relevant metrics, I'm going to bore you with it even more than the process. However, no matter how technical and editable and real time it is, you do not need code, personally. Someone needs to. But are you a developer? No. Got that right. Well, you're Get out of our... <laughs> Sorry. I mean, no, but all jokes aside, the startups, most startups, at the beginning, in the beginning, or for a while, don't have developers other than outsourced teams. It's very difficult to, to, to do all of that. But the good news is, this is simple coding. The better news is, you don't have to do it. However, again, I'll go back to the questions. If you can't ask the RASP the right question, you will not get a thing out of your <coughs> absence. Nothing. Asking the right questions. I've said this a couple of times in this talk today. Mostly when I went through uh, the, the tables. Are you asking the right question? Or this is the right question to ask? Because that's at the core of any growth. And the mother of all questions for here is that I've asked this before, and this is what I want to conclude on, is what should I measure to see if my objectives are being met? And it's a bit complex as an, as an issue, because as a marketer, I measure everything I do. It lean, uh, cleans up after my mess, so I put on tracking things, and she makes sure everything works fine. The question here is, is in different parts. You have the business objective, right? The business objective has a KPI. You want to build a community. The number of members in your community is, your KPI, is one of the many important KPIs. You want awareness. The views and the click-through rates and the engagement rates are KPIs, right? They all meet the objective of community building. And I give metrics with a dashboard that says, you know, these are my metrics to tell you that I'm a great marketer and that I've been building your community like hell and it's looking great. Then there's the funnel object, uh, measurements. So I can measure a lot of things in terms of business, and I can measure a lot of things in terms of marketing, but all of these top line KPIs cannot be truly informed if you don't have the bottom line KPI to make them work. Okay, so it's, it makes the, uh, we don't have a whiteboard. So imagine this as a pyramid. Again, you have one business objective, you have three, four, five marketing objectives under each, and then under each one of those, I have my operations, my tactical operations, my branding operations, my lead generation operations, my website traffic operations, and so on. And each one of those has its own set of metrics. And now all of a sudden, those who don't like math are trying to leave the room. Uh, again, you need to know how, to, how it works. You don't need to make it happen yourself. That's, that's a marketer's, sometimes developer's job, okay? So, if you remember, we said we can explore audiences. We can A-B test the audiences, and then we can measure results of audience, uh, on audiences. And I can draw conclusions such as, having, having, sorry, having marketed to each um, audience on its own, I can say, 1824 in Beirut who buy online through my app preferred the post that had the image of uh, people in the city rather than the one in the, in the, in the countryside. <coughs> they went on our pages, and we found that the one with the form at the bottom, with a simple button that redirects to the form, was converting them better. And giving us an average of $10 spent per month per uh, paying user. Okay? Who of you understood all of the words I said? Everything, like all the things I just said. Okay, all the during the it's, it's not, again, we're, we're not rocket science, but we're nearing a bit of more scientific approach. I have math, I have coding, I have actual analytics. In, in, in two, three years, I'll have enough interaction history to hire a data analyst, even as a freelancer, to come and spot patterns, look at sales trends, look at you know uh, audience preferences on a very, very granular level. And that's what big companies do. That's what PNG, Unilever, and so on, that's what they do. They can know exactly the wallet share of their users. That mean how much of their of their salary per month do they spend on new leader products, for instance. They don't do that with magic. They do that with math. 
And they do that, do that with that kind of stuff. They go, they survey people. They ask them, how much do you get, uh, do you earn per month? How much of that goes specifically to, sna to food, to snacks, to snacks from the Mars company? And they know, they have 2% of their salaries. And they put as marketing objective, we want a bigger part of our consumers' wallets. But not any consumer. We want that just with the, with the, the household uh, leader, the under 50 uh, working woman. Because she has one to three kids, and they have the biggest amount of mouths to feed for that. Okay. That's an example, that's a big scale, large scale example of how we use analytics. So they, the people who are using this on a big scale, they study the lifestyle of their users. You, you don't have a few billion dollars to throw on that. However, you do have a few hundred bucks to throw on an ad. You do have some time to research your audience. Specifically, if you know them, if you have access to them, you can pull them for free. You do have time to tell your marketing agencies, please just change a button or a, a fold on a website. And specifically, you do have the time and the obligation to understand which audience and which operations get you here. And then, you still need to create a relation with the business objective, right? So it's a funnel for the user, but it's also a funnel for you. Have the data. Have the insights. You, you said that. You get insights. The insights very important. How do I understand my user? How do I understand their interactions and their preferences? <sighs> Optimize. You've heard this today. You've, you've heard it before. You will hear it more and more in the next uh, few years. Optimization is the name of the game. It is actually the obsession of all marketers today. You think you optimize 1% it's gonna come for nothing? Okay, buy an overall website, let's say that's a day 100% and see if you get results. <coughs> Unless it was a much needed model of your website, it's not gonna do it. But if you improve 1% of the interaction at one stage, the first, and then you optimize 1% at the second stage, and then 3% on the purchase part, and then you make you up your results of uh, up 2% on your remarketing. That's how you create the real good experience across the board. If we go back to the hourglass, I'm not gonna go up the slides, but if you go back to the hourglass, I'd rather have a 70% performance across the board and optimize each one to reach 90 within two, three years, than have a few areas where I'm at 100 and other areas where I'm at 10. So, Create a harmonious experience across the board. Make your users enjoy interacting with you. And then, uh, bit by bit, they'll become customers. But it's a long run game made of little quick wins. After we optimize, we experiment. Well, we, we optimize while experimenting, but then, imagine this. <coughs> You're a marketer, and you know exactly what's the bottleneck. I know, I can give you an example of a client that will not be named, but <laughs> the client had a software app uh, for lawyers, and he had a specific problem that people download his software and have a bottleneck exactly at the moment where they have to use it for more than a day. They open it, they use it, they leave. What happened? Can anyone have an idea why they would download the software and drop out after a day? Does anyone have? No, it's a very expensive software in the first place. It's enterprise software. You're going to pay it up front 50, 70 The application logs them out so they forget to Let's say. Sorry? Not user friendly. Capacity. Sorry? Capacity. Capacity? What do you mean? On the phone. Oh. No, not necessarily. No, they, they was easily downloadable. They actually opened the software, most of them, but they dropped out. Well, it was very simple. You open the interface, you have no clue how things work. It's all over the place, and there's no like, proper guidance. So we, we did two things. First, we put user feedback all over the website. Different users randomly see different pieces of feedback. So we they get feedback from different users on the landing page, and then on the create page, and then on the contract page, and so on and so forth. We collected all the feedback, we saw what was wrong, and chunk by chunk, we rebuilt the experience of the post sale. So first of all, we put a little tutorial that kind of showed that walked around the different areas. There were four areas, each one dedicated to a specific area of the world for a lawyer. So we kind of introduced them to the areas, and then when they went into each, they had more indications. So we went to see, do they do at least not find at least more pages per session on, on the software? Let's see. We saw that, and then we optimized. 
We tried new things, we A-B tested, we drove 50% of the traffic to a type of page and 50% to another, saw which one interacted best, and page by page and screen by screen, we optimized and their, uh, their metrics went up. So experimenting, trying things, just saying, oh, I have a bottleneck here, it's not optimization, it's, it's really experimenting with a totally different way of doing this ex experience and seeing if it works. I'm gonna conclude this by simply reminding you that you define your user journey. You define it first. What's your, what are your market, business objectives, marketing objectives, and operations? And under each operation, how they're gonna go. Explore every possible way you can on your audiences, on your, uh, on your pages, on your ads, on your content, on your format of content, on even the URL. We, we have fun with URLs for instance. We try things. We sometimes put a different, we see if artnet.birdhouse.com works better than birdhouse slash artnet.com. Anything can be tested. You just have to explore it. And then measure. That way, you always know what's working. Um, yeah, no more questions. Uh, I'm gonna finish with one last example and a couple of recommendations, okay? In a former job of mine, uh, job client, we had to get 100 applications for a corporate program. 100 applications is not easy. It's a company, it's not a person. So it's a person that applies, but it's a company. <clears throat> Meaning you have, you have to have 100 leads from your online campaigns. Meaning you have as audiences, base audiences, followers, entrepreneurs, database members, banks. I had a couple more, but I'm not going to show Right. By different messages for each, of course. Social media, the content, were in the format of videos, pictures, blogs, PR, and affiliate marketing. Landing pages were A-B variants, so we had different buttons and calls to action on each, based on the audience. Sorry, so if it's a bank, they understand about their interest in the corporate program. If it's an entrepreneur, they learn about their interest in the program. And if it's an insurance company, they learn about how they will benefit from entering <coughs> sorry, the corporate program. The short form, we had a massive form. How to get people to fill out four pages of information, not all of it being you know, one, two, you know, A, B, and yes, no questions. Something that takes two to three hours to fill, and not in one go. So we need to minimize the information, but first to generate leads, and then remarket these leads so that they would continue. And then you need special links on the email, because when you sign up, get an email that you signed up and you get redirected to the rest of the form. The long form needs to be able to save between each page. There are four pages I want you, I want the form to save between each page so that when they click the link that's on the email two, three days later, you have all the information from the short form and the information they've already entered. That's user experience because they're gonna see my content, they're gonna see my landing page, they're gonna do my short form. And then if the form is too long, they will not fill it. I knew that because of former campaigns. Everyone dropped out of the first page. They come back, they see it's not filled, they're like, oh, I'm not going there again, thank you. So we needed to make it easier. The easiest, don't have to think. Oh, I have that email, I just click, it's gonna to go to the page, and it will be filled, I just have to finish it up. Right? The metrics. Here's what we measured. The, well, not the full thing. We examples of what we measured. Hello. Views and reach, <coughs> impressions, click through rate, and for the emails, open and click through rate. They went on the page. So time on page. Are they going to our external links? Are they seeing our main website? Where are they coming from? <coughs> what? So for instance, Facebook drove enormous amounts of traffic. We made a lot of money. Twitter, almost close to nothing. Here we, we, we saw the submissions, obviously, easy one. We measured the submissions, we tried a few variants, but that was nothing big. Confirmation email, some people didn't open it, or some people opened and clicked, some people opened and clicked. We kind of remarketed specifically those who opened the email in a different way than those who had not. And finally, in the long form, we looked at the dropout pages just to see where people were stopping all that. And I, before I, um, I conclude, I'd like to tell you that it's very important that you remarket if you have two-step signups, that you remarket those who submit without completing. We did two video, two email shots, and one final personal call 
to each company that had started the process and not finished it. We went through every application, every every unfinished application, pulled out the numbers and the emails, and did a full campaign just for the this segment. And instead of getting 100 leads, we got exactly 173. That was pretty fine. And a few considerations before we close this session. A lot of this is going to move very fast. Don't try to catch up technically. Try to catch up as a business. We covered a little bit, just a very tiny fraction. There is in-store interaction. You can quantify that on Facebook and on Shopify, by the way. There's uh, real-time behavior in the store. You have people looking at Zara stuff, buying it online for 20% less. Do I try to fight it? Or do I make an app that recognizes the barcode and can instantly you know, sell you the thing instantly, the clothing instantly? What do I do then when I, have, when I sell groceries, for instance? But I can't quantify my sales from one channel. Can I explore a way to track these specific users? It's gonna get bigger. Machine to machine communication is gonna get much more advanced than it already is. Right now I think it's about 60 to 70, I forget the exact number. Percent of all machine-based communications are only machine to machine. We barely consult any of that information. How are you gonna treat it? How are you gonna make it a part of your, of your uh, marketing? And how are you gonna generate more data from your customers, whether it's in the form of a CRM, or surveys, or analytics on the website? And how am, I, how am I gonna make sense out of all of that to properly segment, to properly test, and to properly optimize? Well, good news, hire someone from now that can do this because in a few years you'll be programmatic. You won't have a thing to touch, you just need an employee to manage all of that. Thank you. All right, we have five minutes left. Any questions? Yes. What's the use of uh, real-time analytics versus uh, historical data? Versus historical data. You need both. You need both. You need to hit and understand historical data for volume and for trends over years and decades. But you also need real-time data to see, well, you may want to look at real-time data because it's always interesting to understand, to observe at different times of day, at different, you know, specific landing page. If you're doing specific landing page, you can actually see heat maps real-time, you can actually track users on a user basis. Michel Hello coming to my website, I can give him a user ID and track exactly what he's doing now. On the spot with mixed panels, for instance. You have, it, you have it in the as well. Sorry? You have it in the as well. Yeah, but it's different. You treat it differently. You treat it differently. The, the historical data, you treat the volume. The instant data, you treat the, the user per se. It's better to treat your user per se when, because if you have 100 people online at the same time, you can look at that information. If you have 300 people, you can look at that information and say, okay, I can conclude something out of this. If you have 12 million sessions in your history, you can't take the time to look at each one of those. You need to segment it and you need to treat it as a big data set. There, I, I think there's just two different approaches. You don't get the same thing out of it. Um, and the questions that you would ask to your to your, your data. The historical would be about long-term bottlenecks. The real-time would be about short-term bottlenecks. Like, what is, where, what, I want to look at my user going through the experience now. I want to see what pages he's looking at. I observe and I can draw it. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, startup marketing. Yeah. So when it comes to growth and startup marketing, uh, we don't have to, we don't have a budget. Yep. So how, how can we? Uh, you, you know how Airbnb just uh, grows? Yeah. They did. I know. I know. Uh, today, uh, speaking for for myself, we, we can't pay for online ads. But when we do pay, they are performing good, but they are not meeting our target. But for ads, they are performing well. Um, so what are other options? Uh, you mentioned you options? mentioned you mentioned community building, yeah. and I think okay, community building is the I want to call it the growth hack of last century, and I think it's still one of the most relevant because they just moved online. The communities are still there, and you can reach, reach them for free. Your how many people are in your company right now? Okay, if not, half of those are churning out one blog post per week to drive traffic and, com and, com and build communities specifically, each one for a type of, of users, then you're not doing enough in your marketing. That's free, that's a blog setup, 
and that's you have to infiltrate the right communities. You have to be on the right Facebook groups so that when you publish, it, it goes to the right people. Or that if you find, for instance, an existing forum, where are the diabetics going today? Find them, mingle with them. And in the end, what they did, they, the thought behind Airbnb's growth hack, uh, let me tell you about Airbnb's growth hack because it's a, it needs context. Airbnb um, targeted all the people who searched for specific apartments for short stays on Craigslist. And they automated an email, they scraped that information, they automated an email that went to them proposing the service of Airbnb. So that was a hack in the sense that it was purely programmatic, it's a script that they ran. And it only targeted people who were looking for short stays apartment, which is exactly their core target. The thing is, the thought, you have to not understand the hack. Forget about the tech, forget about the automation. All of these are tools. The question is always the goal. In your, in, if your goal is to get people to interact with your brand, then right now, your tool is content. If you want to, grow, to have, the best hack you can do is to deliver this content into niche, um, sorry, into niche uh, communities without having to pay a dime and by automating some of it. So you can always add in, you can always track your exact traffic from there and do specific operations uh, for these, like meetups, for instance, can be interesting for these kind of topics. We're organizing meetups all around the world. Exactly. Every time we go, like, we have to join Plumbab, and we're doing a diabetic meetup Plumbab. Very good. So this is a great way to, then you see when you have a community of a thousand people, if you have a community of 500 people, if they're willing to buy your, to download your app and put one dollar, five dollars in your app, then you already have enough to go see an investor and say, hey, I have 100 people, 500, whatever, a small amount of people, but they are paying. That is, first, a trait of the niche that you go to. Niches pay for services, broad audiences don't. And how relevant they are. So if you have a relevant audience that can pay, you're good to go. Thank you everyone, we're out of time. Thanks a lot.